our next piece is going to be a panel discussion. And we've got um, some folks from um, K-12 education as well as business uh, coming to talk with us. So I've got some questions. I'm just going to go down the list and, and ask some questions. And, um, and hopefully we'll get some wonderful insight um, from some of our community partners. So um, Seth Harvatine, who is the superintendent of Sheboygan Area School District, will be joining us on this panel today. Thank you. Welcome, Seth. We've also got Dan Mella, superintendent of Plymouth School District, joining us today. And Christopher Pierce uh, with Kohler Company. He is the, an organizational development specialist and participates or, or facilitates diversity and inclusion with Kohler Company. Welcome, Christopher. So there are no rules. I'm going to just ask uh, questions, and then whoever is uh, feeling like excited to answer that question, let me know. I'm going to pass you over this microphone so everyone can hear you, and we will take it from there. Um, so our goal is just to kind of learn about, you know, what is happening currently in our space throughout Sheboygan County, uh, maybe to learn from, um, you know, some things that organizations already have in play, and maybe get some ideas of how we can do things um, better or differently moving forward as well. So with that, um, I'd first like to uh, give, it, give you guys an opportunity to talk about what are the current conditions in your space, so whether that be school district or organization. Don't all get it too excited. All right, Christopher, you're up. All right, hello everyone. I haven't talked into a microphone for almost two years, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, you know, when I look at current conditions within Kohler Company, um, like a lot of organizations, we found ourselves really need to take time to step back, reflect, work at our policies and our procedures, and really take time to find where there might be inequities within our organization. And you know, a big part about that was having um, leadership be on board, right? And they're the ones that are helping to get things done. And so we have a very strong leadership team. And last year, we were able to um, comprise a, a team through our leadership. Um, it's called our Executive Leadership Diversity Board, which is chaired by our CEO, uh, David Kohler, and has his direct reports, and as well as a few select individuals throughout the organization. And through them, we were able to rework, I would say, give a makeover to um, our diversity, equity, inclusion strategy. And we've comprised a four-pillar strategy. Um, pillar number one is focused on uh, Kohler teams, and that's really about uh, making sure that we have a diverse workforce, right? So that we are represented um, of community members that we're looking to serve, right, through our products and our services, um, and making sure that it's equal throughout our whole enterprise and levels throughout the organization. Um, our second pillar is focused on inclusive culture, so making sure that we're fostering that environment of um, belonging and inclusion, that's, that's you know, our biggest driver for retention and um, attraction as well. Um, our third pillar is supplier diversity, so making sure that we are looking at you know, diverse suppliers for our outside partnerships, and we look through a lens of both women and minority owned. And then our final pillar is focused on uh, new markets, and that's really a business-led um, diversity pillar, as you know, again, you'll hear me say this a lot, diversity lens, um, looking through, you know, where are those opportunities that Kohler isn't currently in, but is a big miss in opportunity, um, as we want to make sure that the communities that we're serving are also reflective, um, you know, in our, um, our teams here at Kohler. Thank you, Christopher. Sure. Hello, well, well, a little louder than I thought it was going to be. Uh, so, uh, quite different from Kohler Company or from Sargento, uh, Plymouth School District is a uh, kind of in its infancy in looking into EIB everything all together. However, uh, it's been something that's been on our radar for quite some time because it's about workforce. Plymouth has always been a very progressive, active, workforce focused, uh, talent developed focused school district. And we've been hearing for a long time that we, you know, the population bubble is going to be crashing. We need people, we need diverse populations, we need to get everybody involved in the workforce that's available to be there. And so we knew that's we know that that's coming and we know that it's there. And so what can we do to make sure that we're doing our part to kind of mimic exactly what Sargento and what Kohler and, and those companies are doing? 
So we need our students, the, the ultimate employees of our local companies, to be functioning well in a global society, culturally uh, uh, adept at knowing where things are going to be, understanding diversity issues in the, in, the, in, in, in the classroom, but then when they're moving on. And so it's really, really important that we need to feel like we're doing what you need as employers, but we're also doing what is needed for the kids to be really excellent uh, adults growing up wherever they end up, hopefully back here, but wherever they end up. And so lately, with all the political things that have been going on, uh, some of that has been an issue because we know that I think when we've been uh, having our discussions, we're in lockstep with we want our kids to be ready and, and, and be able to function in, in society in a global uh, in, in culturally in a, in a global environment. However, some of these political bombs that keep getting dropped here and there are not in lockstep with what we want our kids to be. And so part of why I really wanted to be part of this meeting was because I need to understand, we need to be talking the same language and we need to be working together to build up our communities so that it's welcoming no matter which school district you're in, m which co company you're in, that we're all together saying we need to attract a diverse population of people to our communities. And so that's really what I wanted to be part of this for. So we're in our infancy, but we're working together to make sure that we're aligned with our local companies and industry. Try to get, try to get those microphones back together, Dan. Yeah. Uh, from the Sheboygan Area School District, over the past several years, a, a couple of key things that we've been able to engage in. One has been to, to develop a, a leadership team that's been working, and uh, two of my the, the instrumental people um, in the room, Jake and, and Jim, have been a part of that, that team and that work. To really, um, the first step was to put in some um, principles of equity. And so we took uh, seven principles of equity to our board. Uh, and it was really uh, work through the entire organization. Communication, you know, obviously is a challenge of uh, being a very large employer in the, in the, in the community or in the county, uh, having almost 2,000 full-time, part-time, and casual employees. That, that becomes a challenge. So how do you get everybody working in the same direction? But those seven principles of equity uh, work through a, a team, work through uh, a lot of feedback from our district stakeholders and ultimately ended up at our board level, and so our board uh, adopted those seven principles of equity. The other thing that we've been able to do is to put in place, um, as part of our strategic long-range plan, some equity pieces around, uh, much like Chris talked about at Kohler, uh, a part of the work we do around students, because that's in first and foremost why we exist, but then also around attracting and retaining employees um, one of the challenges that, that we face is, like everyone else, a workplace, a workforce shortage. Um, but we also know that our workforce is not reflective of the community we serve. Uh, about 48 to 50 percent of our students are, are BIPOC students, and yet less than five or six percent or so of our teachers are BIPOC teachers. So we have this, this gap. So we've developed some specific goals that really focus around how do we recruit and attract talent. We also know some research around education says most of our teachers are teaching within 30 miles of their hometown. So how can we look at a grow our own and really tap the, the, um, the, the skills and benefits? Dr. Marchman talked about that in her presentation about, about really you know, engaging our youth. So we have some sp a specific goal around uh, how do we develop and attract talent um, to do that. The, one of the other things that we were able to do as a part of this work thus far is to do an equity audit. And we had an outside consult consultant work with our team to look at our board policies and to look at our student handbooks and to meet with some students at the high school level in order to look at our, are there some structural pieces, some maybe quick wins, some, some things that are right in front of our face that we just don't see that we should be looking at from a structural standpoint and uh, so we're now working to implement the recommendations. Um, again, we're, we're, we're in the infancy as well, but we've taken some key steps. Awesome, thank you. Um, and you, you kind of mentioned this, so I will um, 
we'll talk a little bit about, uh, tell us about ERGs, so employee resource groups, and I know lots of our organizations have them, but also student resource groups. And we learned a little bit about those today uh, with the Menominee Falls. Um, and I understand you kind of mentioned Sheboygan Area School District. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about your ERGs and SRGs and whatever other letters we should use in there. Um, <laughs> BRGs, ERGs. Um, and, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, kind of why, why did you decide to move forward in that direction? What value did it bring? And maybe what are some of the outcomes of those conversations, no matter how new or um, how long they've existed? Who would like to go first? Yeah, so a, a couple of uh, groups that we've really tried to tap into on the student side is uh, uh, we had students come forward. Um, it really came out uh, around um, at South High School in particular, a group that was formed called We Rise, and they named it themselves, and it's working to eliminate racial injustice and support equity. Um, students got together as part of a, a survey that was done during the last year during COVID, and, and right at the end of that, uh, that first summer, uh, in really talking about how can they have a better voice, uh, a greater impact, and wanting to make change within their school. Um, and they've had a, a good fortune. There's been a, a few uh, articles written in the, in the press. They've gotten some, some TV coverage. Uh, they've been meeting with local politicians. They've had an opportunity to, um, to really identify, much like you heard in the voice, what are some just some structures um, strategies, what are some difficulties or challenges that they're facing, and how can they put together a new set of lens, of a perspective to support that. And we also have a new group starting at North called the Start Change Club, a uh, very similar focus in terms of how can we really look at high school students to, to gain that voice. But we've also had some long-standing groups that I think is important to look at as well, our, our Gay Straight Alliance groups. Um, and looking at how do we look at sexual orientation and, and other, you know, being a parent of a transgender child, I understand the types of, of struggles that children go through and how do we really look at that in terms of potential impact in, the, in future workplace environment. Um, the gender neutral bathrooms, the, the also understanding that for transgender students and uh, children, the, the high rate of unemployment, the high rate of mental health issues, and how do we as a workforce, you know, work on that. We also have a Hmong Leadership Council at North High um, and really trying to tap into what are we hearing from the Hmong community? How are students feeling and that sense of belonging? Where aren't we? And how do we provide those leadership opportunities? So there's just a few student-based groups that we've got going on in the Sheboygan Area School District. This thing th seems to be coming apart as we're, as we're moving around. Could you imagine doing this exercise during last year of passing microphones without like, a, a fogger like completely like, like yeah <laughs> uh, we have a couple of long-standing student groups that, that we've had in uh, Plymouth for uh, uh, as well and we act as one of them uh, and, and there's another one students for social justice those two groups have uh, specific advisors and uh, they act on different uh, causes and uh, things racism sexual orientation all of those types of things are commonly uh, some of the some of the work that they're doing, and they kind of help consult with the administrators in the buildings where those are and where those issues are occurring. Uh, however, we have also started working with a consultant for our employee side of things, and um, that person is uh, has taken us through a couple of uh, exercises. And what we want to have happen with that is ultimately than a more formalized uh, student group to be an offshoot of it as well. And so, we're, we're, again, we're in our infancy with that, but uh, I think already some of the things that we're uh, doing related to uh, the gender neutral bathrooms and, and trying to work through those issues and then also uh, some of the um, racial uh, undertones that are um, in, uh, in the different buildings and around uh, being dealt with more intentionally. And so those are some of the places that we're uh, beginning for Plymouth. Make it work. Um, at Code Company, we call them business resource groups. And I took time to write them all down because I know if my leaders watch this and I leave one out, they're going to be messaging me on Teams. Um, so we have fo groups that are focused on uh, veterans and supporters, um, the black and African American community, uh, mental health, um, Women's Alliance, um, Hispanic Heritage and Latinx, um, in Indian Heritage, 
um, LGBTQ and young professional. Um, a gap that we also currently have that we're working on filling and launching before the end of the year is a differently abled space. So we're currently um, comprising our leadership team there and working on their charter um, to have it launched yet this year, but officially start driving great work um, in Q1 of next year. Um, our business resource groups first launched in 2018, and you know that was definitely a very grassroots initiative um, when it came to both um, the LGBTQ community as well as the Women's Alliance group. You know, being in manufacturing, you know, and uh, you know, working as well within the power line of business, very male-dominated spaces. So women's alliance groups have actually branched off specifically into those business units. That way they can make sure that there is, um, you know, that mission statement and initiative is being pushed um, even up to the highest leadership. And then as well as um, our executive sponsors that we have um, are also male and leaders within the organization, and that's through allyship. Right, because I think, and that's one of the biggest things that we communicate through our business resource groups, is that you don't have to be a direct member of that community to be a part of that initiative, right? Um, and when we look at the founding of diversity, equity, inclusion, it's truly built on allyship. Um, you know, the B is really symbolic in business resource groups. They truly are change agents, not only for our culture of inclusion and you know finding that sense of community at Kohler, but really, you know, they're driving business initiatives. Um, so we have our Women's Alliance group who is working on a project called Gendered Innovations, and that is making sure that any products that we are um, designing or gearing towards um, women, we make sure that we have female representation at the table at those decisions, right? Um, we're our Kohler Proud Business Resource Group partnered with our hospitality line of our Kohler chocolates and actually produced uh, 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 pride chocolates for the month of Pride Month, and they were able to raise funding to then be um, donated to PFLAG, which is an organization they work with very closely. Um, so our business resource groups, they um, are, on, I would say, on their next evolution um, you know, of reaching globally. Um, our Women's Alliance is actually currently has operations both in India and China, and we would be launching our differently abled BRG globally as well. Thank you. <coughs> And we've heard a little bit about this, but I think it's important that we spend a little bit of time talking about um, what are the barriers. So we've heard a lot about things you're doing, things you want to do. Let's talk about some of the barriers to um, achieving some of these initiatives or goals that we've set for ourselves. We could pass it wherever you'd like it to go. Sure. A couple of barriers I think we heard already today, and that's you know, time and resources. How do we invest the time, take the time that's really necessary and the resources? And, and we're such in a school environment, this start in September, cyclical calendar year, you end in, in June. And then, you know, where does that time fit, especially for our teaching staff, which are, you know, our point of contact for our students? So we're really looking at how do we better use our time and resources. Um, internal expertise. Um, sometimes you feel like if we don't have the expertise, we need to know everything, and I think that's an area where we're trying to get people to understand that we, we've, we've got to start, we've got to engage in the conversations, we've got to engage in the work, but we don't all and aren't all going to be experts when we start. The other piece is the political climate we're in, and Dan mentioned it a little bit, and, and I'm, I'm sure Dan will give you some space on that again to talk, but we're here today to talk ab about, you know, words of inclusion, words of equity, uh, you know, talking about you know, how do we support all and each and every person? And yet, uh, over the past month, uh, the uh, State Assembly in Assembly Bill 411 passed a bill for education that, uh, although it hasn't gone to the Senate yet and it hasn't gone to the governor's desk, but the ramifications of that bill, which is, uh, you know, rooted in, in culturally responsive or cul culturally, <laughs> excuse me, critical race theory. CRT, I'm getting my acronyms mixed up because we have so many. <laughs> but you know, the, the bill is rooted in that. However, the author of the bill included words, equity, it included words such as inclusion, diversity, social emotional learning, or SEL. Those are types of words that would be prohibited for schools to discuss and or teach our future workforce development you know, individuals to teach our students that we wouldn't be able to do that. And so we have this issue that this, we're on this collision course of we're asking for it in our businesses, we're asking for it in our organizations, but we wouldn't be able to teach it to our children and understand, and where are all of our kids going to get that? 
uh, and that, that concerns us. So how can we work as a group to, to really combat those types of legislations that are, that are not going to be good for all? Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Here we go. There's two mics there, you yeah. can drop one if you need to. <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. Bills like AB 411, uh, although it's destined to be vetoed, it, it, it won't see the light of day, it's still there and it's drumming up you know, fear among certain people. And I would just add to that because you explained 411 and the whole point of it and, and the fact that the, all the words that we're using here today in this discussion, they're, I've got the bill sitting over there, they're, it's, it's all, they're all listed as things that you wouldn't be able to discuss and in fact there might be a potential fiscal liability to the district if an individual in the community found out you were using these words in a discussion with students that they could sue or petition the state to decrease your funding by $15,000 every time you got caught doing some of this stuff. So it's not going to see the light of day. However, it's been floated to see the light of day by certain populations of people. And so that's the other group that I would like to, the, the, another barrier that I would like to, to talk about as a, you know, as a school person is just the <coughs> beliefs of our, uh, of our kids. We have kids that are growing up in households where uh, things like uh, transgender or things like race are talked about and not like they're talked about here. And so having the space and the ability to allow those conversations to happen in schools when the kids are little and learning, away from their very influential parents um, who are super important in their lives, but to at least let them explore other ways of viewing the world is extremely important because without the ability to be in a safe place to understand that, that there might be a different way to understand race or gender and that it's okay and that you're not going to get yelled at and we're not going to tell anybody what to do, but we need the space to be able to explore those things. And so that barrier, the incoming beliefs of the students that we teach, it's not really a barrier, it's an opportunity, um, but we need to be able to open the doors so discussions can happen about those, those topics. And so that's why we need our business community and our local communities and our chamber and the schools to be understanding that we're all talking the same language. We all want the same things for our students and our communities and our workforce. And so um, we need to be able to go back and tell our legislators, no, you've got this wrong. This isn't what we're about. We want to be able to have an inclusive discussion with all the people that care about these issues. So. Um, you know, from you know, the business side, I think one of the biggest barriers is you know, DEI is a continuous learning journey, right? And you know, we're all starting from a different point. And so being able to uh, meet people where they're at, you know, I've been you know, in this field for a little while and I've seen leaders struggle with the right words to say, right? Out of fear of saying the wrong thing, offending someone on their team. Um, but you know, we can't afford to not have these conversations, right? So I think some of those conversations, critical conversations, need to happen through humility, right? And sharing when you have made a mistake, right? Even someone who works in this space, I make mistakes, right? And I continue to evolve and learn from them so that I can do my due diligence to help coach others through that same journey. And you know, I think another big part about that is being getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? I think that's one of my favorite lines, and hopefully you've heard it already today. Um, but you know, when we look at other barriers within Kohler, you know, as a global organization, being aware of what diversity, equity, and inclusion means in China, in India, right? Because you know, what we're running here within the states is different, right? And how diversity, equity, and inclusion is looked upon is different, right? S in some locations, um, you know, we uh, parts of the world, you, know, you don't look at your demo uh, demographic workforce, right? As it's not looked upon as something that is um, okay to measure. Um, so I think that's one of our barriers, but then I would say, you know, working within manufacturing as well, um, that's a very unique population, 
and you know we're continuing to work through um, how we best tap that um, talent pool that we have and in incorporating our DEI measures and metrics um, into them as well. Thank you. And lastly, you guys get to get out of the hot seat. So yay you. Um, can you uh, just maybe share with us, you know, what advice would you give to, you know, we've got a lot of educators in the room, we've got a lot of um, leadership in the room from many of our county-wide organizations. What advice would you give to them to, you know, if they're in the journey already or if they are just thinking about starting the journey wherever they're at in their space, what would you tell them? Yeah, a couple things, maybe just one or two. Um, you know, I would say, you know, and you, you um, I believe you heard Laura Kohler um, say this from her video this morning, but at Kohler Company, everyone is a leader, right? No matter their, um, their title, their level within the organization, everyone is a leader, and thus they have a place and a position to play within our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. So my advice is empower your own people with that same philosophy, right, and leading by example, especially to our people leaders. You know, they're the ones that have the influence, but also our individual contributors have influence amongst their direct team members, right? And you know, their experiences um, and their success stories working through diversity equity, and inclusion is impactful um, and helps to you know, create that positive narrative. Um, I would say you know, be an ally as well, right? So be a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion and all the things that it encompasses um, you know, and challenge you know, the different perspectives, right? Respectively, of course. And you know, when those different perspectives um, approach you, don't necessarily um, criticize, right? But rather, perhaps, um, with open mind, an open mind, right? And looking to learn in your journey. Um, and you know, one final one that I would leave you with is, I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure that I uh, said it, is again, take it one step at a time, right? Because I think d diversity, equity, inclusion, you cannot boil the ocean. Right? It's not something that is going to be fixed over time, but it's being able to take the time to learn where those inequities are happening, where those crucial conversations that need to continue to happen in order to create that culture that you're striving for. Thank you. Again, we're, I'm, I'm really here learning and trying to understand what people that have been doing this for quite some time uh, have learned already. Uh, so just from my perspective as a, as a relative newcomer to this space is that I need to approach it from a position of humility and um, non-judgment. We, uh, we all have our biases and, and we have to recognize those, but for myself and I think probably for anybody else that's beginning this pathway is that yeah, I have to come from this as a, from a position of, of non-judgment. That can be difficult in a situation when, you know, we're confronted in a public setting with, you know, angry people and uh, things about CRT that we don't even teach, and but yet it's still this rallying cry. So, for us, we have to try to understand and listen and probe for what their uh, understanding of the, the issue is, so that maybe we can find some common ground, or at least maybe move those other issues off to the side and focus on what's important, which is having our kids being ready for uh, a great success in, in a global environment, so. I'd agree with what you, know, you both have said. I think I'd add two things. One is that, you know, it's a journey and we know it's gonna be a long journey and how do you celebrate some, the wins in each win? Um, and how do we take time to celebrate uh, those small steps, you know, uh, instead of waiting till the end, whatever the end may be. So how do we celebrate? The other thing would be, in order to celebrate, what types of metrics or data are you using to make determinations? Are you making the, the next step and are you having progress? So what kind of metrics are you using for your in different indicators so that you're able to know, are we making progress and gaining ground or you know, we're just making the assumption we are, and we just keep going, and it may not be the best strategy at the time. So what types of, of metrics are you using to, to identify, whether that's focus group surveys, whether that's, you know, uh, participation rates, whether that's, you know, your, your workforce attraction and retainment of your workforce, et cetera. But what are you using, and how is that driving your decision-making to move forward? 
Thank you so much. Can we give a round of applause for Seth, Dan, and Christopher? Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Awesome.